The sapphire swan was drawn towards the two stone pillars by the current. Captain Lark watched the water, but couldn't see the current's source. The sails had gone limp. So, why were they moving? He stroked his chin in thought. Whatever the reason, it couldn't be good. Those stone pillars were narrow. Oh, he knew they could slip through them with no problem. Still, why the current? Curiosity got the better of him, and he climbed up higher. All the way to the crow's nest at the top of the ship. It swayed heavily, but Captain Locke had lived up in the rigs before. This was nothing compared to that storm in 1322. It was nothing to the old sailor. Wind whipped at his clothes as he drew out his old spyglass. The bronze surface was tarnished from years of use. Peering through the dirty glass, he scanned the waters ahead. It spun and turned. A whirlpool was growing there. Bigger and bigger with each second. Turn us around! Full turn! He shouted. As he jumped back to the deck, he cast his spell. Flames erupted from his hands to heat the air behind the sails. The air expanded and created a whirlwind to push the ship back the way they came. Too slow. The whirlpool was opening. Teeth were being exposed. Wait. Whirlpools don't have teeth. A monster. It was swallowing them. Water poured into the giant mouth. The ship tilted. Captain Locke grabbed onto the mast. Two of his men screamed as they fell overboard into the torrent below. They fell into a deep pit surrounded by waterfalls hiding teeth and flesh. The noise of the cascading water drowned out the crew's voice. Captain Locke looked up and stroked his chin. This was bad. He had to think of a way out. Smiling, he saw the path. Welcome back to Mythical Phylogeny Adventures. It seems that our good captain has found himself sucked into the sea swallow, Charybdis. Let's take a look at the strange creature of legend. Charybdis originates from Greek mythos. She was the daughter of Poseidon, but angered Zeus by stealing land for the sea. He chained her to the sea floor and turned her into a bladder-shaped animal, with flippers for arms and legs, and an endless thirst. She drank three times a day, creating a massive whirlpool which will drag ships down. Then later in the day she will belt up the water once more. She has influence in the tides, even before she was condemned to exist as a monster. She lives at the end of the Strait of Messina, where a fig tree grows above her. At the other end of the strait lives Scylla, who we'll meet next week. They live close enough to each other, about an arrow shot from each other leading to the trap which has caught many sailors. When one tries to avoid one, they often land in the jaws of the other. The original rock in a hard place. She has plagued many heroes. Probably the most famous was Odysseus. Okay, we do know a fair bit to start with. First off, Cryptus's mouth should be big enough to swallow a boat. We talked about their size in our Dandan video two weeks ago. The smallest of sailboats is a good 20 feet. So that is her minimum mouth size. But if we are going to create the legendary whirlpool spoken of in legend, a 20 foot mouth isn't going to do it. No, we'll need much bigger. The longest sailboats come up to be about 500 feet. Now, opening up a several hundred foot hole in the ocean will cause almost anything to fall into it. But there are a few problems here. First off is how. We need to figure out what Charybdis is. It is a bladder shaped with an outer extremities which can look like flippers. I first thought that it was a rotiferor. And I am betting that most of you have no clue what the blazes I am talking about. They are known as the wheel animals. Weird looking, right? You probably think that you've never seen one before. Well, these are only a few millimeters in length and easy to miss. Usually they live in the sand, but they can move a little. They have cilia around the jaws which create currents that bring in food and provides for propulsion. Behind that is a jaw-like structure which can chew up its food before being swallowed into its stomach and then out through the anus. Oh, that is a problem. You see, legend says that she belches the water out, but the rotifer pees it out. This is a much slower process and wouldn't create the tidal surges spoken of. No, this means we don't have a complete digestive tract. Food goes in the mouth and back out. This is what is called an incomplete gut. 
a trait found in primitive animals. This removes the rotifer from options. So what other creatures do this? What animal has this particular trait of having only one opening into its body for digestion? Well, there is one phylum that has it, the Nidarians. Who are they? This group includes jellyfish, corals, and a few others. There is even a group of jellyfish named the Cribidae, which happens to include box jellyfish. This phylum is characterized by having two germ cell layers and an incomplete gut. What do I mean by germ layers? This is based in early development. Each germ layer develops into different tissues and organs. This may be an issue later on. This sounds more of what Charybdis is. Overall, Charybdis sounds like a giant sea anemone. This is a single polyp structure that relies on snagging small animals to eat. They use their tentacles to bring them. Usually, they can stun or paralyze their prey. Wait, this isn't what Charybdis does. She opens her mouth and sucks in the water. To do this, we'll need to improve the muscles. I touched on this with the marrow, but Charybdis will need to use all of its muscular strength to push all the water out of its central column and the digestive tract. But to open it, that will be a real feat. You'll need to push literal walls of water away to open the mouth. This will be difficult and require a great amount of energy. To push the muscles this much might be why Charybdis only opens her mouth three times a day. Once she swallows, she'll need time to digest the vast column of water. They'll need to get everything to the bottom where her stomach is. One way is to deoxygenate the water. For Charybdis, this means to simply breathe it first. For a creature this big, oxygen exchange is going to be important. For the sea enemies, they don't have a heart to pump blood, which they also don't have, in order to oxygenate their deep tissues. Which means, Charybdis isn't a true sea enemy. In species that have two germ layers, the ectoderm becomes the outer skin and the bones, while the endoderm forms the digestive tract and limited internal organs. The heart and muscles form in the third germ layer called the mesoderm, and most other animals which have the more common three germ layers. This is part of why I was at first leaning towards the rotifera, which has the three germ layers. So what is this? Finally, that it takes this long to look at the phylogenetic tree. But here it is. This shows us a few of the families in the Tree of Life. Not one of them truly matches Charybdis. What I think that Charybdis is, is a branch that occurs just after the Sedarians but before the next ones. Just after the evolution of a third germ layer and then involves a proper respiratory system. Producing a blood-like component would be important for this creature, just due to its sheer volume. We don't necessarily need hemoglobin based blood. I did mention the hemocyanin before. Which kind doesn't matter. What it does is that it needs to have a very high oxygen uptake rate to suffocate the prey caught in its mouth. Okay, I think we have it nailed down. We have a slightly more evolved sea enemy with a heart and blood. This doesn't match anywhere in the phylogenetic tree since hearts evolved much later than the completion of the digestive tract. But it matches what we have. There could be some better options, but they all have a complete digestive tract, and the incomplete gut is the oldest trait. It'd be hard to imagine it losing the complete gut system. It is a seriously important evolutionary trait. It keeps waste out of its mouth. Now, would Charybdis have teeth? It would be a bit of an evolutionary jump, but we already have a heart and blood system forming here, so not completely impossible. They could also exist as a support structure similar to the spiculos and sea sponges. Now, the last issue is that Charybdis is said to have flippers for arms and legs. These are probably just repurposed tentacles that are wider and short. Charybdis is an ambush predator. She doesn't hunt, she sits and waits. She'll let you come to her, so unless you go near her, you're safe. Her location is well known, so it shouldn't be that hard. In addition, she only moves three times a day. That means if you know when she is swallowing the ocean or belching up, she's even easier to avoid. You have a pocket watch, right? But no matter how well your plan is laid, something will go wrong. You get a torn cell or the wind abandons you. 
and you end up near Charybdis as she drinks. The first thing to do is keep yourself from ending up in that mouth. You'll need to stop the water pulling you in. Option one, levitation. Float your ship into the air. Who doesn't love a flying boat? Just take to the air and go right over Charybdis' mouth. She literally can't do anything against you then. Option two, freeze the water. A powerful ice pill to turn the water solid. Freeze yourself directly to Charybdis if you can, or make an ice sheet bigger than her mouth. Once she closes, you'll have all the time to thaw yourself out before she opens her mouth. When she does, you'll get a nice wave to ride out of there. So what happens if you don't have a mage for these spells? You can use the bubble trick I talked about with the Dan Dan. Create a bubble that is too big to fill its mouth. Just prepare all the alchemical ingredients beforehand. Of course, that doesn't work and you get swallowed. You'll need to escape quickly. Poison will cause her to open her up earlier. If you can get the mixture right, you can mimic the hormones that she used to control her body. Lightning will be devastating, but make sure to insulate yourself from the backlash. That can kill or even hurt Charybdis. And if you get the muscles to work right, you'll get Charybdis to open her mouth again. Once dead, you can force the mouth open by again by force or using a lever system. Or you can cut your way through. Up through the mouth would be the easiest option. If that doesn't work, you'll just need to be patient. If you can keep from being crushed by the encroaching walls, you can create an opening using cannons and other large weapons. Air will be in short supply. If you have diving equipment, put it on. Sadly, you'll need to last about 8 hours before Chris will open again. Now, she takes time to close, so you do have room to act. Just don't waste it. Magic is going to be your best tool here. That and just not getting caught. Sally, if dumb luck is the only thing you're depending on, I can't rate Charybdis more than a 4 out of 10 for difficulty. Just don't go in her mouth and you have very little to fear. So, if you did slay Charybdis, what did you get? To move that much water, you'll need muscle. And you can eat muscle. Jellyfish and scenery aren't the best in flavor, but can do with spices. Next, there are the toxins from her body. While not potent, you can concentrate them to use in battle. If she has teeth, and I am questioning that, you could use them as ramming spikes on your ship. As for potion ingredients, the tissues can be used in protective solutions and healing potions. But overall, Charybdis is more of a hassle to harvest than you would gain. But you could time it and lure a foe to over her. Think about it. You are being chased by pirates, and they follow just as Charybdis swallows the ocean. You know about her and escape, but the pirates, they get a well-earned watery grave as you float away to safety. When she belches out their ship, you can loot it for goods. They'll be a little waterlogged, but still good. Captain Locke moved to the bow of his ship. Magic surged in him. His skin tingled with electricity. Pointing his fingers, he leached it into the wall of muscle ahead. The tissue twitched and spasmed before falling open. Water rushed in and lifted his boat higher and higher. They were knocked about, but the captain kept up his spell. He kept up the rush of power until they reached the top. The torrent of water surged in and forced their ship forward. His crew rushed through the rigging to set sails. A wind gathered through the narrow strait and caused them to speed forward and away from Charybdis. Cheers of success swept over the men. Even Captain Law gave in to the jubilation. That was a mistake. As they sailed forward, he didn't see what was hiding inside the narrow passage at sea. Thank you for watching, adventurers. This is a rather frustrating creature that took some work to understand. And I hope I am correct. I hope you can prepare for such a creature in your voyages. Next week, we'll meet the second part of this two monster combo. Scylla, until then, I'll see you on the roads.